So um, I'm going to talk about queer theory. Now, I didn't choose this title, and the first thing that struck me title was it's in the past tense. Uh, what happened to queer theory? Because um, it's been around now for 30 years. Um, in 1990, when the term was first um, used, and here we are, you know, for 30 years now. And it's always been a problem. The first thing you start with queer theory is, well, what is it? And that's because it's a, a slippery thing in that it's never had an agreed definition even when it was first used. And over time, it's, it's changed somewhat. And it's always had two um, elements to it, which you could say are um, queer theory and queer politics. And they both come from two different areas. And what I'm going to argue with, I've definitely outlined, is the history of queer theory, saying it was really a child of the 90s. It was born, particularly in America, ideas, taken up earlier ideas from the 80s, uh, generated a new theory, particularly with Foucault and Judith Butler. They're the two key people to which people associate queer theory with, which is odd because Foucault died years before queer theory came along. So he was writing and active in the 70s, and in the 90s his work was reinterpreted in America uh, Foucault was a French uh, philosopher, and then reinterpreted a different way that became the, the bedrock, really, of um, today, what is um, queer theory. But it started off um, in 1990, when the term was, was first used, as um, a reaction to the then gay scene and gay movement. And the person that first said it used the word as a sign of revolt and revulsion at how establishment, the gay movement and gay studies had become. That rather than a sign of revolt and resistance born from Stonewall and the various movements of the 68 generation, it had um, become acquiescent <coughs> with the establishment. And so queer politics was, to, was highly critical and attacking the gay establishment and the family in Germany at the time and it came from the sort of streets. You still get an element of that now and again reoccurring. I mean, there's a series of books and articles by it's Conrad um, that's called um, Against Equality, subtitle, Queer Revolution, Not Inclusion. And that really sums up the idea that it looks to some of the actions of GLF street actions, activity on the streets, see themselves as revolutionary, or want to completely transform society. And you get echoes of that in protests, how tame pride has now become a, a parade led by soldiers and police societies as opposed to celebrating a riot. And so you get an element of that in, in, uh, in queer politics and queer theory. Queer theory, however, was very much born in American universities, very an academic series of ideas. And it was um, a body of a thought that was built around a rejection of the then dominant identity politics. Now, there's going to be, um, behind me are things of the sort of earlier period. When the gay movement was born in the late 60s and mostly in the early 70s, it had a lot of... Um, um, confused ideas, but they saw themselves as revolutionary. They wanted a new society. They wanted radical revolutionary change. Um, that was part of a general sweep of unrest across most societies, whether it's in Paris, whether it's in Prague, whether it's in Hanoi, whether in the liberation movements, um, the women's movement. There's a great sweep of unrest. But as Marx put it, the, um, the past weighs like a nightmare under living. That unrest came at a time when the ideas of the left were completely dominated by Stalinism and by reformism. And so revolution tradition, which has, these days tend to get called classical Marxism, was a tiny, tiny minority, only held by a few sects and groups, often in distorted form. So the previous history of, say, the sexual politics movement in the Weimar Republic, or Edward Carpenter, or those had to be rediscovered, but been forgotten. So when people in the 1970s were looking to theories to explain the world and the new uprising of the world to live a new revolutionary time, 
and they, most of them rejected or looked to Marxism. The Marxism they looked to was Stalinism. So in America, Maoism, so it wasn't classical Marxism, it's now called, which we're part of, it was a distorted form of Marxism anyway. So their rejection of that was from a distortion of Stalinism and stage theory. And in that tradition, sexual politics had been bleached out. The combination of Stalinism and fascism is literally almost eliminated the memory of the earlier um, homosexual rights movement in Germany or in Britain and the various things on the Bolsheviks had done was completely un unknown at the time of, the, of that movement. So then when you get to like the period of the Empire Strikes Back, of Reagan and Thatcher and the swell of revolt seeps down, you then get, um, because all movements, particularly in the gay movement, the domination of identity politics and that is either separatism, um, political and radical lesbianism, and the ideas around oppression that you form, I suppose they're now called, safe areas where you can be what you want to be, cut off from the rest of society. This could take the form of communes, but the most dominant form is talk with the pink economy. That um, in, in cities, areas became like gay ghettos. So it's Castro in San Francisco, it's Boys Town in Chicago, um, it's uh, Wittenberg Platz area in Berlin, I suppose it's Soho in London. There are certain areas which became sort of um, safe areas for people to live their lives. And the pink economy, pink account, there suddenly was a, um, a capitalist version uh, where people could relate to. So this was adapting to society. So the politics were one which fed into this idea that you no longer a revolution to change the world, you can just fit in and find your own little niche inside it. So you, um, and that was the dominant idea is that queer theory and queer politics rebelled against. They hated the idea of um, how safe and establishment prone the gay movement had become and disliked the word gay and to, uh, to use, the, use the word queer as a sort of in your face attitude that we're, we're not going to accept the the status quo and the respectability that suddenly um, we have become. That was the ethos behind it. Theoretically, but again, I think ideas follow the movement. And the movement which was, actually was, be, which was happening at the same time as these new ideas were putting forward, the reinterpretation of Foucault, I need to go and explain Foucault more thoroughly how he was used in a different way than it was before. Before we come to that, was the fact that, as well as I said, the empire strikes back, you know, in Britain, the miners, all the workers were attacked like the miners' strike. In America, Reagan attacked the workers. But and in hand with that, which has always been the case, when the workers and left are attacked, the movements were attacked as well. The AIDS virus became a moral outrage against, it was seen as a gay plague. <coughs> there was a huge sweeping back uh, for the rights one in the previous period and a real storm of reaction. And against that, there was a fight back. ACT UP in America was a mass organisation. ACT UP puts tens of thousands of people on the streets and it was some of the actions back to looking back to the GLF. They were again out of the, out of the you know, Stonewall riot was um, out of the closet onto the streets. With, with, with people then off the streets into the universities to save spaces, they came out of the universities onto the streets again for ACT UP. And people wanted to have a politics that linked people together. Rather than people separated off into their little self defined, self identifying niches, what is the theory that links them all together? And they sought to um, find theories that would do that. And the identity politics came into the great attacks and criticism from the, this viewpoint, having seen the need for people to unite. And certain critiques of aspects of the movement were expanded to give you um, a world view of and ideas which can therefore challenge the world. So that it's the, from, so the ideas that come into queer theory are the similar sort of motives behind uh, privilege theory. Privilege theory with a particular critique of feminism by black women was then expanded to, to give a, a theory of everything. Um, intersectionality was again 
a particular critique of, uh, again, mostly uh, within women's movement, the feminism, but it was a critique of aspects of the feminist movement of that period as they've been expanded to uni uh, a big uh, service attempt to cover all. And queer theory follows that history. It comes from the people seeing the need to try and link together. And in, in that, in America, it fo focused on, uh, on Foucault. Now, Foucault was a French writer, philosopher, who, when he started writing in the 60s, I mean, he died, was it 89? 84 he died. Foucault died in 84. The first use of the word queer politics was 91. Um, so he would have been, I think, quite surprised that he is the founding stone of this movement. And Foucault himself was of the left. Um, you know, he was in a of the Maoist left, in fact, before he rejected Marxism. But he rejected a Maoist Stalinist version of Marxism, which explains uh, some of his politics. But his, his uh, ideas, again, changed over time. He started writing on philosophy and prisons, and then he moved to writing his famous history of sexuality and moved towards general theory. But not look, but rejecting Marx, he looked to Nietzsche. And the other thing to say about um, what Foucault's ideas were happening at that time is after the failure of the 68 rebellion, particularly in France, there was a great disillusionment with the Communist Party and Marxist Communist Party ideas at the time. And um, there was a, a move towards a rejection of Marxism because he associated Marxism, Stalinism, and the Gulag as one. And the new philosophers came along, of which Foucault was, and they looked towards structuralism. Now, we're going to get too heavily involved in this. But what Foucault, was, was, Foucault argued that there are deep, deep structures in society, which you can't really understand, that move and shift. The society moves from one period to another period. And if you're in one period, you can almost can't comprehend the next period. Deep, deep sort of themes, he called them. And that... To study society, every society has a high has um, oppression going on. All just having a relationship with somebody creates a, a, a relationship of inequality, and one oppresses the another. It's Nietzsche's concept of power, and therefore the way forward, the way we, we he identified with the oppressed. The oppressed have to fight through the margins of society, and um, so any fight against normality. And then he used those ideas later to analyse in detail different societies. Now, there's many things about Foucault being criticised. He tended to use obscure facts, which shall later be tested and shown to not be true in his historical analysis. Um, and he also, if you think of it logically, is incoherent. If you can't understand the previous period, because you're in a different theme, how can you write about Greece? Who knows what they were like then? Because it's, you're literally alien. It's like a, a multi-universe concept in physics. How can you comprehend another universe if you're in this one? But, so, nevertheless, what he was very good at is, is detailing how oppression worked on many different levels. So even though I think his theories are wrong, even wrong theories can give great insights and descriptions. So in France and Europe, he was used where revolutionaries moved towards reformism. It was a rightward shifting move generally speaking. Many of my friends I knew in the GLF in the 70s were reading Althusser and Foucault and, and that led them to join the Labour Party under Tony Benn and all that stuff. It was a move to right. But in America, the ideas were used the opposite way around. Foucault was used in America to argue against identity politics. That we're all actually, that oppression is, is, is not one of you fighting on an individual level, but the fact that it's the structure of society that needs to change. So Foucault was used as a way of, we have to unite, we can unite together if we understand society creates oppression or we can change society. How you change society, that's when the problems come to queer theory, but the, the need to change it is there. Similar with Judith Butler, um, the other the great queen of, the, of uh, queer theory. She argued the same thing on, on gender lines. They argued that um, gender is not a natural fact, that is a socially conditioned, socially controlled. And so society um, 
lays out the rules by which we're supposed to conform to conform um, how many genders our particular society has. Here it's two, and the societies had three, some had four, etc. And his, but why there should be two, three, or four, you just put it up very clear. In fact, you try to read Butler, nothing is very clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, rather than reading Judith Butler, I say, if you want to see ideas, go and watch Some Like It Hot. Some Like It Hot <laughs> is everything that Judith Butler is talking about. <laughs> to being a man or woman, just what clothes you wear, how, what you roll, and even at the end, he comes to live it. And then he's got a sort of lovely uh, queer theory ending Some Like It Hot. Some Like It Hot is Judith Butler's theories before Judith Butler. If you haven't seen the film, you know some of the jokes. But I, it, that's essentially what she's arguing. Um, and the, so this is how queer theories come about. It was using 70s ideas new ways in the, in the 1990s to fit and respond to the new struggle going on. What's happened to it now? Well, the problem with it is it set off to attack the established gay movement. That was its prime aim. And you had groups like, you know, we've got the details of that, we can cover it. How long have I been going on for? 15 minutes. It's only another five minutes to, to um, get to any point I'm going to get to. Yes, so when we look at queer theory today, what you see is that, ironically, it has evolved into the very thing it attacked. It was attacking the safe, nice world of the gay scene, what we've got, we've now got queer studies. You know, it's a nice career ladder. Rather than, rather than attacking the establishment, it's been incorporated by the establishment quite nicely, thank you. Wonderful PhDs can be gotten and grants and stuff to become a student of queer studies. It's attacked identity politics, isolated, and what does queer, living a queer life, well, it becomes lifestyle again. You use certain language. And Foucault ironically, came because some people reject Foucault really um, very much so. I mean, what's his, oh yes, James Penny wrote a book, After Queer Theory, which I think is wrong. He makes many critiques of Foucault, but he sees Foucault and queer theory as a conspiracy of neoliberalism. Because neoliberalism can, because queer theory can go hand in hand with it, be accommodated. He sees it as an ideological attempt to un, uh, as part of, uh, of neoliberalism. And I think that's a bit like, uh, that's ultra-left nonsense. I think Foucault was always of the left and fought for the, uh, and was with the uh, oppressed against the oppressor. The thing is, because he, he didn't believe in liberation. And the Nietzsche, though you can't achieve liberation, you can just achieve little battles against particular uh, liberation, which then lead to further ones. It's not unlike Edward Bernstein's, actually, idea. There's no revolution, they're just constant struggles on the thing. You, you, and the other thing that's happened to queer theory, and many of the theories I, I've mentioned before, that developed from ideas of the 80s, have been expanded to be universal theories like intersectionality or privilege theory. A particular critique of society which is valid on, on its own terms has then blown up to uh, be <coughs> un, universal. It falls over because it can't, it can't uh, contain the, the entire world it tries to be. They've all come from the academic world. And the academic world has been increasingly influenced by the pressures of the market. There are now writers, lecturers, professors have to produce, have to be published. And the more obscure, the better. There's a sort of, uh, in the art world, gobbledygook world that grows up. Um, it's um, people uh, in, have confused uh, obscurity with, of, with profundity. <coughs> Um, as Nietzsche of all people put it, they muddy their waters in order to peer deep. There's nothing more <laughs> for that. You know, which, you know, and that is, that, that, that is what has happened inside the theories of academica. And so the other, that also makes them very pliable. These theories can make it fit anything. So if you read books on queer theory now, it can be anything, you put the word queer in it. It can be a straightforward sociological um, study in the sort of liberal <coughs> sense, and it's if you put, put the word queer in, fine, there you are, because there's no overall concept of what the term is. It can be used to mean anything. So it's a catch-all term, just as gay was 
30 years ago. It's be- it said, the irony has become. There still are elements of revolt involved in it, and there still are, can be very deep uh, and uh, useful, well, very good analysis of oppression, that it's without an overall structure that leads to any great struggle, and like I would say, um, classical Marxism, which has always been a tiny, tiny minority. When people say Marxism these days, they always think of Althusserian, structuralized Marxism, and not thinking of the classical Marxism. Um, I'll finish up with a couple of things, because um, there are a few other things knocking around which have come out in the, the publishing world. Um, I will quote this one, because I think it's quite an interesting thing, is that there has been use of some queer theory ideas, like Holly Lewis's book, The Politics of Everything, which I think is very good at um, criticising the identity politics, but also the politics of safe spaces. And she comes from a sort of lesbian commune that put these things into practice. And as she points out with um, um, the problem with a safe, safe spaces analysis and those sort of uh, micro-politics, as she says here, again, it comes from Foucault, everyone oppresses someone, if not systematically, then through microaggression. Therefore, the development of political forces can only affirm social oppression because forcing itself is oppression. Here, the abstract concept of power is what must be opposed. Politics becomes anti-politics. The new politics becomes anti-oppression training sessions, not a critique of ideology or self-reflection, but actual confessionals. In other words, a religious ethic of sort has replaced economic and political analysis within feminist fact- practice. The only forms of force that are acceptable are self-defence and self-protection, which without larger macro-political content becomes exhausting. The development of safe spaces become an anti-political project of resistance with no strategy for overcoming or or even engaging with what lies behind the oppression. So I'm not saying that these queer politics are not of no use, but their very insightful critiques could be used against them themselves. (laughs) Um, there is a, uh, uh, somebody arguing, Holly Lewis, who, who is using queer politics to criticise another, uh, well, therefore, safe spaces, uh, intersectionality, but that could be just said against queer politics itself. Um, another attitude, so, so there's been a sort of, um, the gloss has gone off queer politics in the academic world as these things happen, a bit like the art world. Oh, you know. This year's revolution is next year, is, is, is last year's revolution, this year's yawn. You have to move on to a new theory, a new something, a new, you know, to challenge it, a new establishment. That's, you know, so passe. You get um, uh, Peter Drucker up in Manchester, had a big impact with the book Warped. And rather than um, have an overall theory, he mashes together every sort of theory together. And so you get Althusserian Marxism and oppression and feminism. All I just put together to explain a particular situation. But if you step back one little centimetre, it falls apart because they're overall, you know, because these theories he's using are in contradiction to each other. So he sort of postmodern, there is no overall structure. So you get that sort of um, mess. <laughs> um, and the other thing I want to say is, yeah, let me come to that, because I will, I know there's a meeting on it, but it particularly, I re- read it interest recently, so it's on my mind, social reproduction theory, which is, again, American, or well, Canadian, mostly, to be honest, a series of what it calls social, social reproduction theory, which is an attempt to um, put Marxism back on the agenda looking at oppression. Unfortunately, the Marxism they're using, I think it's really watered down Marxism. It's not classical Marxism at all. Like it makes total concessions to the, the Italian autonomous ideas like the um, um, Fe- Federici and Wages for Housework. And um, it, has a good, it has a good critique, actually, by McNally of um, intersectionality from a philosophical point of view. He says it's a Marxist critique. It's not actually a Galian critique. I think Marx has mentioned what's called Hegel, Hegel, Hegel. Um, it's good, but it's abstract. But the major problem with, I think, social reproduction theory is that it looks at what is unique about living labour. The, the Marxist key is that workers are not just another group, a threat group. They make society because they make living profit. 
But so to be that everybody in that definition is a worker. So if you're a gardener making nice flowers, someone, a worker sees those flowers, likes the flowers, you <coughs> made profit just like the engineer or the nurse. Or the, so it, 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 it waters down. They say they're extending marks. I think it's water down marks. So you end up just have a, a very general theory of trying to just give it a Marxist gloss to the oppressed. And it's just the oppressed all together. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think it's a great um, um, advance of, of using Marxism. I think still the, 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 the person I personally look to, and I think we should look to, and I think the person that this is actually argued against, because they come from a reaction of that tradition, is actually Chris Harmon. And I'm very much a harmonist. We sound like I'm in a, in a choir. But, <laughs> but if, you read, if you read Chris Harmon's... Because all these ideas were around in the 80s, and they were all debated in the 80s. And if you look back at spring 84, Chris Harmon was arguing against what became um, social reproduction theory from the German autonomist. He was arguing against the social feminists, etc., and putting forward a classical Marxist alternative. And they are available in selected works, I noticed on sale. So I think Harman and classical Marxism do provide um, a better uh, appreciation of oppression and queer politics. The queer politics should be dismissed and it's very engaging in some aspects but again I, I do think there's a title of it says the way it's gone from um, <coughs> resistance to the norm, it's become the new establishment um, which has some good points to it and you can see it in the fights that overall it's become what it's set up to destroy. I again just want to say thank you for a really lovely talk. Um, so I've been working as the LGBT officer at my university and I've been seeing a lot of queer politics cropping up but I've actually been noticing it going two ways. One is the one you mentioned where it becomes almost very assimilationist and becoming the new norm. Well, we've kind of seen it with the feminist movement where it just the identity of queer gets diluted to mean sort of everything to everyone and it ends up meaning nothing to anybody. Um, but I've also seen on the flip side of that people that are wanting to keep it as a more radical thing actually engaging in quite destructive behaviours. Um, some of us have coined it queer theory so radical it's homophobic. Um, <laughs> where you know you get people, so I'm a lesbian, I've had people coming up to me saying it was discriminatory against non-binary femmes, bearing in mind femme is a lesbian term, or someone coming up to one of my friends who's a trans man and saying he had it easier because he's living as a binary gender. And so we're sort of seeing the two flip side of it and the attempts to keep it radical, it actually sort of ends up hurting, uh, hurting the community itself. And that's why I really like that you brought it back to Marxism and how there is sort of a common struggle that underpins it and we need to find what that is and hold on to that. So thank you. I'll just take two or four. Yeah, okay. Um, I've got three more people. There's um, uh, you come over back. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Brilliant. <coughs> Um, is anyone going to Pride this Saturday? Now, I, I wanted to bring that up because Pride, when it first started, obviously, with, with, after the Stonewall riots and that, it used to be a protest as well. So we're talking about queer politics and all the wonderful groups we saw in those Im images. But Pride now, like Pride in London, has become very highly commercialised, as we all know. So people like Virgin Media, Coca-Cola, that's doing all the plastic in the oceans and all that, all get all the big floats, while the true uh, sort of uh, groups who are trying to get their voices heard are pushed to the back. So um, Gay Support the Miners, a couple of years ago, um, wanted to do a march. They said they were only allowed a certain amount of numbers. So. Um, it's really, really um, affected, really, what, it's like, more like a, what I call a party now than what's the true message of it, you know, and it's lost the family friendliness as well, and the amount of litter I've seen after it is unbelievable. 
Um, I'm bringing a lo thing local back into my local community, or bringing uh, queer politics and um, pride, the true meaning of a uh, political and anti-racist. And it's basically Wolf and Forest, the London Borough Wolf and Forest. This is the fancy T-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, and this is our leaflets. So it's basically just this. It says, uh, celebrate our lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans community and join the ongoing campaign for equality. It has the location, the postcode, and it'll tell you that we have evening uh, as well with acts such as Victoria Sponge, who is a drag queen in East London. So um, we've got a variety of acts, but this is more important. We're trying to bring back the traditional roots of pride and bringing in queer politics as well. So if you want a leaflet, please come to me because I've got loads. Thank you. So. Hey, um, I, I wanted to ask because uh, as of late I've been trying to do uh, more reading into uh, the history and the queer theory and the politics of asexuality. And I've been finding there to be somewhat a lack of resources, to say the least. But I didn't know whether if, if you could suggest, or if anyone else in the room could suggest, some literature, some pamphlets. I mean, I found some really good, uh, slightly more academic-leaning websites, because, you know, when people are broke, they will put their well-written stuff online. It's better than now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, because it's, it's, it's one of them, I've, I've, I've really liked that there's been more discussion about it. We have several openly asexual members uh, in the Manchester branch. Uh, we all go along to Pride. It, it's amazing. But it's one of them, you know, you want to be able to talk about these things in the best political terms you can. So it's, yeah, and, and it's quite difficult when you can't say, oh, we'll try reading this because there's nothing there. But so yeah, if any suggestions, pass them along, share the information. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back and answer those ones, and then we'll have a series of them, otherwise I'll forget half of them when I come to the end. Um, about Eastern Europe, every, every time there's um, a recession, um, the ruling classes try and find the scapegoats. And since 2008, the same thing's happened. Uh, but there's been a divergence in the East and the West. In the West, and it's always the usual suspects, um, that get a scapegoat um, and it's always the migrants uh, traditionally it was um, Jewish people um, it was black people um, it was gays um, it was all the various symbols in the concentration camps um, that was um, there um, but what's happened this time around is that um, partly because of the groundswell of opinion around um, what was called the gay movement. When the gay movement was attacked, as I explained, ACT UP was very big in America um, during the 80s. It wasn't so big in Britain because we had the NHS and what drugs there were, there was access to them free. That, was, of course, was not the case in America. And in France also, there was a. Anyway. So ACT UP. Was, existed in London, but not on the massive scale it did in America. And it's interesting how Britain differs from America generally in the gay movement. The gay movement always looked to the, tra to the trade union and workers' movement here, or in America they never did. And they didn't really have one to relate to. But here, even back in GLF days, um, and the, <laughs> people have a fond memory of Gay Liberation Front to roast into the last. If you're part of it, it, wasn't, it could not be that rosy. I mean. I mean, the problems which have bugged the movement ever since come from GLF problems in that um, they didn't, because of their reaction against Stalin, they didn't, have, didn't believe in hierarchies. It was horizontal organisation, which meant that those could talk longest got their way. Because you had to come to a consensus. They just wore you down. You agreed to those who got the, who could speak longest and had more time to do so, could, could get their way half the bloody time. So meetings were endless until some sort of action and then they were geared towards stunts mostly and there was some sort of stunts aimed towards picketing weddings because of course it's a bourgeois institution of enslavement of women and radical drag and radical effeminacy and all that stuff but a large section in Britain always looked to the trade union movement because at the time, the 70s the workers demonstratively had power 
So, um, <laughs> and we were often greeted very well in the 19, late 70s, going on picket lines and demonstrations. There's a very amusing picture of some dockers were put in prison by the Tories on the Pentonville Five. And it was almost a spontaneous general strike breaking out because the, the dockers brought out Fleet Street, the, the newspapers, and the engineers came out. And there was a sea of people surrounding Pentonville Prison where the dockers were detained. The only ones to bring banners were the GLF. <laughs> so it was a very peculiar book of the small sort of GLF, then the sea of workers around them. But that was not the troops of the GLF at the time. <laughs> but I mean, they did relate to the working class then. And even in the, when the attacks went on in the 80s with the, I called the Empire Strike Backs, it was in the trade unions that gay set up, uh, fought back. That's why when the, you know, so, uh, Lesbians and gays support the miners was not it wasn't only just happening there in all the trade unions there were various gay groups being formed so like under cover of the uh, awfulness of the AIDS thing in Britain there was this sort of sea change happening within the labour movement so it was the miners of all bloody unions given its history who led the motion um, to support gay rights at the TUC conference and all the rest of it so in Britain there's always been that sort of link to it. So, what's, so that changed in Britain and to lesser extent in Europe. When the recession came in 2008, that meant that in Britain there'd been a sea change in attitude towards lesbian and gays among the population. And it was not thought um, possible to scapegoat gays, even though we traditionally we are in recession because, of course, if the welfare state goes, who's going to fill the gap? The family the heterosexual family, who challenges the family by just being there, we do, unless, you know, etc. But, but instead, we've been incorporated into the imperialism of the Middle East. The only reason you go to Afghanistan is for gay rights, of course. We were, we were on the fig leaves. So gays have been incorporated into um, the imperialist agenda. At the same time, there was a sort of... Um, gays are... Um, Lesbians and gays now are supposed to um, be just like straight people. You get married, you have kids, you know. What's, how nor heteronormal can you be other than you have to be, you know. So there's been a, an attempt to normalise the deviance. You know, um, we're non, you know, we're supposed to be as, as, as nice and vanilla as all the rest of it. Um, as a famous leader of small <coughs> riots, said Marsha P. Johnson, she, she was asked about... Um, whether she was fighting for equality. She said, no, I'm not fighting for equality, for revolution. I don't want the same shit everybody else has. <laughs> and that's what lesbian have got. They've got the same shit everybody else has <laughs> and same expectations. Um, so in the West, gays have not been a scapegoat. Um, the usual suspects have. The Roma, it's always the Roma. The Roma, because of the wars. It's uh, the Muslims, because of the wars in the Middle East. You go through it. In the East, it's the same old scapegoats. It's been gays. They've not had that history. So they've, they've, they've been one of the ones that have been a scapegoat. Again, it's the Roma. In fact, they take the, the worst butt at the moment, I think, in the East. It's the Roma, and it's, and, and it's, and it's gays, then it's any foreigners. It's that sort of... These things happen in times of recession when they're looking for a scapegoat. Who do they look to? And they look to the same set of people every time. Um, the second thing was about uh, the personal, about um, the way the personal and political slogan switches time again. Because it used to mean your personal problems you have aren't caused by you, they're caused by society. The personal is actually political, and the way to change it is to change society. That got switched to identity politics. It's the way I am is political. Just by being in a certain way, I've transformed, I, the revolution starts with me. So just by me living a revolutionary way, 60s, 70s, it meant living in the commune and all the rest of it. Now it will mean just having a different lifestyle, different language. You can, that, that, is all the, that is what political means. And I think that is a very limited sense. It was criticised under identity politics and now you can criticise it under, under <coughs> clear politics and all the rest of it. And finally, uh, someone said about pride. Um, you can't believe how pride has changed. I mean, they, uh, for an example, the fight on in Sheffield, because Sheffield Pride doesn't want any political slogans on it. <laughs> it's not a political event. 
And it's no longer called a demonstration, it's called a parade in London. It's called a parade in London because soldiers aren't allowed, or the armed forces aren't allowed to go on a demonstration. They can go on a parade. And for many years now, London gay parade be led by the lesbian and gay armed forces in uniform marching along after the police, etc. You know, that's how I'm thinking, this is what I fought for. You know, <laughs> you know we can be beat away anyway. So um, the way that happened was, again, it's interesting historically, it used to always be a demonstration, sometimes was once attacked by the police on the outside this building, in fact. There was a big confrontation was in the late seventies. One of the few ideas when I actually had an idea that had some effect on the world because the police were battering us down and I went to the building and pressed because the, the, there was always events in you know, it was called Yule in those days in this building the, the gay march would come here and there was meetings and socials in here uh, the gay pride would end here and I rushed and pressed the fire alarm so the building emptied and suddenly the oh. few hundred the police the few thousand the police got pushed back <laughs> <laughs> so it was <laughs> So, but I mean, uh, that's what they were much more computational in those days. That completely transformed now. They're completely commercial events, and that shows it. And the last thing I'll say is about the history of the gay movement in Britain. It's just not. I know it's not been written um, because there was two. There was in London. There was two gay centres. One in Brixton, which has been written about, and because they were in, actually on TV on that um, uh, Thorpe Scott thing. There, there was Brixton as they were. Brixton Gay Centre outside picketing over Thorpe because they were into um, radical effeminacy and challenging and picketing weddings and things. The other one was East London Gay Centre, which was in Whitechapel, which in those days was a very run-down area. It was getting attacked all the time. And they looked at the working class as the way to change. They're the ones that went to Pentonville and the rest of it. And in 76, 70, it was a commune, about 40 people there. I think go to things. And they voted, I think, in 77 en masse to join the SWP, <laughs> I think to the horror of the local history, because they suddenly had all these, you know, swarming in there. Uh, they joined. They could be, they'd be fighting the National Front, who were very strong in those days, in, that, in the East End and stuff, and they voted. So there's always been these two divergences, even in the glory for days of GLF, it all wasn't one marvellous, lovely time. <laughs>